Hello everyone. Today we are going to be taking a look at a paper. It's been a while and this is actually a paper in the field of computational neuroscience. Very interesting. Now if you don't know a lot of neuroscience or a lot of anything in this, don't worry. I'm going to be breaking it down as we go. I know I normally don't talk about this sort of stuff, so I'll make sure to sort of cover all the background knowledge. So if there are any really complicated subjects that come up or anything you don't know, don't worry. I'm going to be explaining everything as I go. So with that out of the way, let's get into this. So the title here is Burst Dependent Synaptic Plasticity Can Coordinate Learning in Hierarchical Circuits. So what does this mean? Uh, and, and how does it have to do with AI and neuroscience and that whole thing? So I'm actually going to continue on to read the abstract right now, or at least a portion of it, and then go over sort of what that means. So in the abstract, let's see, so starting from right here, synaptic plasticity is believed to be a key physiological mechanism for learning. Cool. It is well established that it, is, that it depends on pre and post synaptic activity. Cool. However, models that rely solely on pre and post synaptic activity uh, essentially blah, blah, blah. They can't account for how all the learning happens in the brain, especially when we take into account the fact that we need to be doing credit assignment and hierarchical networks, very hard stuff, blah, blah, blah. That's essentially uh, what it comes down to. What does that mean though? That's, that's a lot. Let's start with this idea of plasticity and neurons in the brain. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here. As you can see, there's an art, uh, a nature paper. So let's scroll down and maybe zoom in to the right. Hopefully this is enough to see. So on the right here, I'll kind of draw what I'm talking about. So let's say we have one neuron in the brain, right? So neuron is like the, the cells in the brain that do the, all the computation or the majority of it. Uh, so you have your little neuron here. Um, well, neurons connect to other neurons, unsurprisingly. So here's like neuron two and they connect to each other. So when these neurons are going to connect, they form what's called a synapse. And that is by connecting two things. One is the axon. So the axon, it's a lot thinner than this actually, the axon connects to the, the, the dendrites, which like spike out sort of like this. This is a really, <laughs> really bad drive um, dendrite. But essentially the whole idea is one of them sticks out a thing, the other one sticks out another thing. They, they meet in the middle and they communicate via spike. So a spike would look something like this, right? Uh, it's an electrical spike. So it's electrical energy and then they spike up and they do there, and that's how they communicate, right? There's either a spike or not a spike, it's a binary signal. And this is how neurons communicate with each other. And you know, this is what neural networks, or artificial neur neural networks were originally modeled after, though there are lots of differences as we've come to know. Uh, but, but this is the general idea, right? They communicate through these spikes. And this paper deals with how these neurons learn. How do they learn? In artificial intelligence, we make our neural networks, or at least our deep neural networks, learn via back, back propagation, right? And back propagation, um, unfortunately, it's not quite biologically plausible. And that's because we have to do things like store the gradients, and that's done globally. And when we back propagate, we have to recall those gradients. And it, it, there's just a few things that we can't do. Quick pause before we get a bit deeper into this. If you do enjoy this type of content, do consider subscribing to the channel. It really does mean a lot to me and it only takes a quick second. Anyway, that's all I wanted to ask. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the video. So this paper deals with how we can understand learning or how learning might happen within the brain. And it explores that first mathematically, it proposes some some ideas and then it goes and actually simulates those using a simulated biological or spiking neural network is what these are called. So uh, explain some of the words and some of the what some of that abstract meant. It talked about plasticity, right? So plasticity is the changing of the weight. So plasticity, these are these are synapses, right? Um, when we change these, that's called plasticity and that's how for the most part we think, uh, the brain learns, right? There might be other components, but that, that's sort of the, the big one. By changing these weights or the strength of these synapses, we can change how neurons communicate. So what this is specifically talking about is we have some rules for plasticity. Specifically, one of these rules we have is called, uh, I believe it's called Hebb's rule, Hebb's rule or something like that. Um, and it essentially states that when a neuron, when two neurons fire uh, in, in tandem one after the other, like, uh, like right here, right? If we had neuron one send out a signal, sorry, this is all in black, by the way, I've been having trouble getting other colors, but when we have one send out a signal, uh, a spike, and then the next neuron or the dendrite right after it spikes, that is going to cause this synapse right here, uh, to strengthen. 
So that, that's essentially what heads rule states. It states uh, learning. So it's like learning via plasticity. So what this paper is saying is that we have these rules, right? We can learn locally, uh, but as you might have guessed, right, humans learn in a number of ways. One, the important ways we learn is through reinforcement learning, through reward, through judging that we did something right or that we did something wrong. And then we should be able to update networks in accordance to that, right? Uh, but if we want to do that, let's say we get some, let's say we know we did something right, right? Uh, we have a bunch of neurons and in, in for this case, let me see if I can scroll down here again. Um, oh, that was not what I meant to do. Yeah, I'm having trouble scrolling for some reason. But let's say we have uh, several neurons here, right? And each one of these circles will represent a neuron and they're like connected to each other and uh, they do this whole sort of thing. Let's say they're like densely connected, right? Um, and we have some output right here. And this output was bad. We did something bad. Uh, that's not good. We want to be punished for that, right? So we might know to strengthen, we want to weaken the output of this neuron when we do this thing, right? That means we have to update all our connections back here though, right? We have to update all these connections and how do we update those connections though, right? As I said earlier, this is solved by backpropagation and artificial intelligence, but we don't really have, we have some ideas for how that might happen, but we're not really sure. So that's essentially what this paper is trying to deal with in these hierarchical networks. And it talks about, you know, neurons with multiple layers, so that, what that means. How do we know which synapses to update uh, when we have something we wanna learn? So that, that's essentially what all this stuff up here is saying, I think, and let me, there we go. This is good. This is good. So let's scroll down here. And as you can see, we have these, this is sort of a, what I was doing before, right? So if you look at these connections, so each of one of these triangles is a neuron and each one of these squares or sorry, these rectangles is a dendrite. So that's where they receive connections, right? So these connections going from one triangle or one neuron in one layer to the next, these are feed forward. So these are connections that go forward in the network. And what do I mean by forward? Why is there any sort of direction? Well, that's because neurons, and I could do this like uh, feed forward, FF for feed forward. Neurons are typically ordered from lower order areas to higher order areas, which is kind of similar to a neural network, right? An artificial neural network, where you have your inputs that are like the input features. And then as you get higher up or, or further down in the deep neural network, it starts generating these more general and abstract features. Uh, if, you, if you aren't aware of how that works, uh, there's plenty of interesting videos and resources out there about it. So these are feed forward connections, but we also have feedback connections, which are from these neurons back to the dendrites. So this would be a feedback connection. And feedback connection is how we are hopefully, hopefully going to be learning. Um, man, it's just randomly scrolling. I uh, gotta love it. So yeah, that, that's essentially what's happening here. Let's scroll down a little bit more and get to this. Awesome. So this is this is sort of the first experiment where they're, they've essentially started simulating neurons. And once they've simulated neurons, they're trying to figure out, given the rules they define, how they're going to interact. Um, I think it's a little bit quick to jump here. So I'm actually gonna scroll down to the bottom of the paper. And at the bottom of the paper, they talk a little bit about how they simulate this. So we can skip this for now. The way they simulate these neurons, right, though, is every neuron is broken down into two compartments. It has its, or most are broken down into two compartments. They have the, so if we were actually looking at it, we would have like, uh, this is like a neuron, right? Well, it would have compartment one, which would be like the dendrite compartment. And then we would have, yeah, this is a bad one. Let me, let me redo that. We have the dendrite compartment and the somatic compartment. So this is dendrite and this is soma. So soma just means cell body, right? So it's the body of the cell. Uh, and these are both electrical circuits, right? So we have some current going through them and that's how they simulate them. Uh, and when we inject current into them, that changes the voltage and how much you know electricity is running through them, that sort of thing. And they simulate that based on these equations over, oh, based on these equations over here to the left. So this is like the voltage term, right? Uh, and when a voltage gets high enough, that's what causes a neuron to spike. So I'm not gonna go in detail as to what this whole thing means, but essentially the most important part is we inject some current I, uh, have some other things happen, uh, and we end up getting out a voltage. And the voltage reaches a certain point, the neuron spikes, and then neurons communicate. So they're simulating a bunch of these neurons using these formulas. 
So now that we know that, we can actually come back up here. Or actually, sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna go over one more thing. So that's how the neurons are simulated. We also have our learning rule or our plasticity rule. This is also very important. And this is essentially the equation that is used to determine how the weights are updated. And all you really need to know, right, is we have, we get some error, and the error is essentially it's a frequency. Uh, a difference in frequency because we don't we can't work with just numbers like we do in artificial neural networks. We have to work with uh, spikes, right? And they're binary, so they can't. You know, the magnitude doesn't really matter. It doesn't change anything. So the thing that does change though is the frequency and timing of them. So this very much depends on the timing and the frequency of when these neurons are firing. If, feel free to look at this, by the way, if you want to understand this better, but this paper's long, and if I go too deep into this, we're never going to get anywhere. Uh, but we'll, we'll kind of, I think as we go into these different graphs up here, it'll give you a good idea of how these rules work, even without going through the math. So let's get into the first experiment. This is, we're going to start with figure A right here. And this is a nice little example. So long-term potentiation is what LTP stands for, and long-term depression for is LTD. What are LTP and LTD? Well, these are essentially cases where a neuron will fire a lot more in a in a sort of time span. It's called long-term potentiation, where we update the weights to have the neurons fire a lot more. And long-term depression is when we uh, weaken the weights, right? That, that's essentially all it is. It's strengthening weights or weakening weights in the long term. So this is describing what leads to a strengthening the weights. If we have a neuron right here that leads into another neuron, well, if this neuron fires in a burst, so a burst is just defined by neurons that fire, or sorry, spikes that fire in quick succession. So succession or success, succession, yeah. In this case, it's defined as 16 milliseconds. It's just a threshold they use in the paper. But here you can see there's a burst here and a burst here. So burst, because there's two in a row, right? Um, and that leads to a long-term potentiation. And the other case is where we have an event. So an event could be a burst or a single spike, right? So it, it's either. An event is any case of a spike. Um, though I should clarify, a, if you have a burst with like 10 spikes, that would still be just one event. So that's the difference between events and spikes. So I, I should write that here. Event is like uh, if we have, we have like one spike. And then a burst is it we would have like spike, 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 spike. Sorry for the terrible drawings, but I think you get the point, right? Um, that's the difference. Um, so coming back to this, we strengthen the weights essentially when if anything fires in the presynaptic neuron and we get a burst in the postsynaptic neuron, then we strengthen the weights. So that's the key here, right? The key is the postsynaptic neuron. If this has a burst, followed by any sort of event pre in the, in the neuron before it, we strengthen the weights. However, uh, if it only has a single event, a single spike, then we weaken the weights. So the key here is the post, the postsynaptic neuron. If the neuron that is receiving the signal bursts, strengthen the weights. If it has no burst, but one spike, we weaken the weights. So that's kind of what's going on here. That's, that's what the learning rule specifies. So these other graphs right here are, are quite interesting. I recommend you take a look if you are interested in this kind of thing, this B through D, these graphs. Uh, but what I want to focus on is E, and, e through G, E, F, and G. So in E, F, and G, they've set up this sort of scenario where we have two different neurons. So this is the lower level neuron right here, right? So this is, this is where we're uh, getting some input and then the signal is being passed through, this is an axon right here, right? Uh, so it's being passed through this axon to this higher level neuron, this blue neuron. So once it receives that signal, it will, I don't know, do something. Um, but then there's two variables that we are controlling here. One, uh, and we're not really gonna worry about this one, but I'll just let you know, is there's some presynaptic perturbation. This is just a current they're putting in to the presynaptic neuron through a dendrite. Uh, and then over here, we have input going in, I'm sorry, I'm drawing so many arrows, it probably gets a little confusing, uh, but then we have distal input in the upper level neuron. So you can think of this as like feedback, right? So this is feedback from other neurons, maybe we're trying to learn, so we send a current into this dendrite, or we, we, you know, we spike, and that sends a current to it, or sorry, not a current to it, but it sends the spike to it, which produces 
a, a uh, rise in voltage, which might cause another spike and so on. And we essentially want to see when we have a setup like this, we have two neurons, one that's receiving feedback and one that's feeding forward to that neuron. What, what kind of happens? And what we see, what we see is let's start with E right here. The blue line you see is the postsynaptic ER, that is the event rate. So, and the, the red line is the postsynaptic burst, the burst percentage, I think. What you'll see is that when we so get a strong distal input, so a strong feedback, right? So this is feedback coming from a future or a further down neuron or further up neuron, I guess, uh, and a weak distal input, those have effects quite dramatically on this burst percentage and a little bit on the event rate. So you can see when we have feedback, we increase the burst percentage, the amount or the percentage that we burst, and we do, and then uh, we decrease, sorry, when we have a weak distal input, we actually lose some of our burst percentage, it goes down. Okay, interesting, but what does, what does that actually mean for anything that probably seems like, you know, why is that important? And it's important because if you look down here at graph F, it actually affects the weight. So the black line here is what the weights are doing. And you'll notice that the weights increase or they decrease depending on the burst. Uh, sorry, it's not the percentage, it's the probability. It's the probability that there's going to be a burst uh, given an event. So when we have more bursts, the weights go up. When we have less bursts, the weights go down. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, and what you'll notice is because the burst probability is controlled by feedback from these neurons out here. So we have these other neurons, right? And they're, they're feeding back uh, inputs into here. So this, this might be the output, right? So the output could feed back to here and it can control the weights. And this is very interesting because it's not so obvious how you would change, like how plasticity could control the weights in a hierarchical manner. We're not doing anything hierarchical yet, but this is a good start, right? We can see that we're feeding back signals and based on those signals, we are learning to change the weights in this case up and in this case down. So interesting. That is all I really wanted to show for this specific experiment, but this is a good start. So let's scroll down here and we'll get to the next experiment. And this next experiment I think is even neater. This one's a bit hard to understand, but we're going to walk through it slowly. In this experiment, we are no longer using single neurons, but instead we are moving on to use multiple neurons in populations, right? Uh, so in this case, POP1 is a group of, in their case, 500 neurons, and POP2 is another 500 neurons. And it's the same sort of setup, right, where one of the neuron, or sorry, uh, one of these, this population one is a lower level, population two is a higher level. So population one is feeding forward to population two. So these are feed forward connections. And then population, uh, I should yeah, feed forward. And then population two is feeding back to population one. And don't worry about all these other little labels. Um, the only two we're going to need to worry about is IS and ID. This is similar to before. In this case, for the IS, this is a current we're feeding into population one soma. So this will be like the feed forward signal, right? And the ID is, again, this is like last time, the feedback signal. And the feedback signal uh, will hopefully be controlling learning. And essentially what we want to do is see if we can, we know we can change the weights, but, but let's take, a, let's see if we can do anything more. So you can see some, these are these little spikes. These are like the, these are the, all the, uh, Right, you know, you see all these little spikes here. These are spikes, right, uh, from the neuron. We don't really need to worry about that. What we are going to worry about is, oop, I guess I can't do that, uh, over here on this right side. So these top two graphs, these two are for higher level neuron. The blue, or I should, I should just say, no, no, that would be confusing. It's the higher level neuron. And these two are for the lower level neuron or the neurons, right? So what you'll see is that if we look down here, the event rate in blue, so the, you know, the amount of spikes scales linearly, or it, it goes hand in hand linearly with the amount of current we put in. Okay. That's cool. Um, interesting. Sure. Um, <laughs> and other thing, another thing you'll want to notice, and I'll tie all this together very soon, I swear. Uh, another thing you'll notice is that this event rate is the same as the one for the higher level neuron. Okay. 
that's also interesting, right? So the higher level neuron is essentially taking the event rate of the lower level, or sorry, the higher level population is taking the event rate of the lower level population through those through these feed forward connections over over here, right? Okay, so we can see that information is passing forward. Um, that's good. We, you know, that's that's a given, right? We need neurons to pass information forward, or how are they supposed to do anything? Uh, but what's interesting is here you have the burst probability, right? So now let's look at this top graph now, and what you'll see is that the burst probability also scales linearly with this current we're putting in this feedback current, or yeah, feedback. So remember this this I of D is the feedback from other neurons. So again, I could draw like other neurons out here and they're feeding back uh, to this. So that, that again, that's interesting. Um, there's no correlation with the burst probability of the lower level population, is there? Um, it, it doesn't look like it immediately, but there actually is. So if we scroll down here and what you'll see is this is what I just explained, right? We, we input the current uh, into the soma of the lower level population that turns into the event rate that event rate gets fed forward to the, this is now for the higher level neurons right here, right? The same event rate. Um, and then we look over here to the feedback current, turns in the burst probability. And what's actually happening is the burst probability times the event rate gives us the burst rate. So this is the rate at which bursts are occurring. So a burst probability is the probability of burst will occur. A rate is what, the rate at which it actually occurs, right? So this is, again, I believe this should be a frequency. Yeah, it's a, it's a frequency. Wait, is it? Mm, I think it is. Anyway, uh, what you'll notice is that the burst rate of the upper level neuronal group, we can see it again right here. This is the burst rate up here. I'll like that. Um, is the same as the burst probability You'll see these are the exact same shape almost, is the same as the burst probability of the lower level neurons. Okay, why does that matter? It matters because we have now conveyed a signal from the higher level population to the lower level population. This might be confusing because it's not a straightforward thing, right? We're not sending back a five and then we get a five. We're sending back a burst rate and we're getting the same burst rate. We're getting the same burst rate frequency. Or sorry, we're sending back a burst probability and we're getting the, yeah, we're sending back a burst rate and we're getting the same numbers, but as the burst probability. So we're sending back some sort of information, even if it's not a super straightforward way of doing it. Now we showed this last time too, didn't we? In this first experiment that we were sending back information and that was changing the weights. So, so why do we care this time that we're doing it. And the reason we care is now we are doing something, I'm gonna zoom out, we're doing something called multiplexing. Um, multiplexing. And what multiplexing is, is we have feed forward signals and feedback signals at the same time. Specifically, we're doing them and sorry, let me set that off screen maybe, uh, at the same time without interrupting the other signals. And this is difficult, right? Imagine, and, and this is this is where the beauty of this paper, I think really comes in, or one, I mean, I'm not sure the beauty, but the, the core point of it. So what multiplexing is, is we need to send feed forward signals and feedback signals at the same time without having them uh, essentially interfere with each other. And the reason why is because as human beings, right, if I have me and I'm a, I'm just sitting down in like a car and I have my steering wheel, uh, you know, super great drawing and I'm in my like little car. Awesome. Uh, it looks like a shoe, but that's okay. I'll just put some wheels on it. Now it's a, a wheelie. Uh, but anyway, or a, a heel, what are heelies? Is that what they call? So I'm, I'm in my car and I'm driving. And while I'm driving in my car, I'm focusing on the road and making sure I don't crash. That's good, that's good. And the feed forward signals in my brain are making sure that that happens. As I drive though, I need to learn, right? Um, so when you're first learning to drive, especially, you're learning uh, you know, different, different things uh, when you should make a certain turn. Maybe you learn that you can take a right turn on a red, at least if you're in the US. That's good, but wait a second. 
we're we're learning and we're still doing stuff. We're doing them at the same time. But those have to those are almost certainly different signals, right? Learning and doing things. So if I can't do both of those at the same time, I wouldn't have the or we wouldn't have the ability to learn as we keep performing tasks. And we do have that ability, so we know something must be going on. Now there are other possible solutions to this, but one possible way of doing this is this sort of multiplexing where we're passing signals back and forth over the same neurons, but those, seg those signals are actually segregated. The learning signal and the feed forward signal of what to do are actually completely separate, even though they follow the same or very similar pathways. Uh, one of them is just for in the forward direction and one is in the backwards direction. And that is very interesting. I think <laughs> this is, this is, was very much a wow moment for me when I finally understood this and you might need to look over this some more to really understand it. I recommend focusing on this D figure right here. I think this was the most helpful to understand it, but this is really cool. And this is essentially called online learning. There is an equivalent of this in artificial intelligence, uh, but, but that's the idea. The idea is that we want to be able to learn while we keep doing things. We can't always stop to learn, right? Like in neural networks, when we train them in AI, well, we, we stop for the training phase and then we stop and do the eval phase. We Then we go to the training phase and the eval phase. We're only doing one at a time. That doesn't work in a biological neural network. Uh, well, it might work, but we can't do that, or at least humans don't do that. So that, that's sort of what this experiment number two is pointing out. And it's a very interesting thing, I think. That's good and all. Um, now, I'm, we're not going to cover the whole paper in this video, but I do want to cover the last experiment uh, or one more experiment, which will be the last we will cover. And it's putting these two things together. We saw the first experiment and the second experiment. The first experiment showed us that we can feedback signals can cause plasticity. or essentially they can update weights, right? So we can do some sort of feedback. And the second showed us that no interference with, or I should say between feed forward and feedback. So with those two things now known, what if we put this all together and we actually try and learn some sort of function or, or something? So that's what we do. That's uh, what the authors here do. This is a network they put together. They have this. These are all populations. So input one, input two, hidden two, hidden one, hidden output. Um, these are all populations of 500 neurons. And they're connected in a way that maybe reminds you a little bit of a very, very simple uh, deep neural network with one hidden layer, right? So we have two inputs, two hidden units essentially in one output. And what it's going to try to learn is XOR, the XOR function. So the XOR function is essentially a mapping uh, where when you have, it should essentially be, it's called, or sorry, exclusive OR for long, right? So you put in two uh, binary inputs, so a one or a zero. Um, and if it, you get one, one or zero, zero, these should both map to a zero, but a one and a zero or a zero and a one should map to a one. So it's a very simple function we're trying to learn, but the question is, can we learn it in a multi-layered neural network, a biological neural network, or simulated biological neural network? So the way they do this is in the inputs, if we have a one, they'll put input or they'll put a currency at, uh, to essentially evoke a high frequency event rate. Uh, and if we have a zero, they will lower the current to evoke a low frequency event rate. So you can see that right here, when both inputs are zero, zero, we, both of them have a very low frequency, both of the input layers. However, uh, when one of them is one and one of them is zero, you can see that it's split, right? One of the currents is high, one of them is low, or sorry, the event rates. And then when both of them are one, now we have both of these inputs at a high frequency event for the event rate. So that's how we input things. Um, and then we, we do this essentially learning algorithm, and I, I'm not going to go into depth in how the learning, learning algorithm works. Essentially what they do, the, uh, I'll, I'll do like a quick overview, right? They put in the inputs, as I said, once they get to the output, they input a teacher signal, right? So the teacher signal will essentially nudge the output in the right direction. So if we wanted a, here, here's a good example, right? 
uh, over here, you'll see a graph. The pink line right here is the teacher signal. Oh, that's uh, not great, but uh, you can probably see it, right? So the zero, zero, the zero, zero, this should give us an output of zero, right? Um, so because it's zero, uh, they give a low frequency is the teaching signal. However, when we have one zero, this is something that should map to one, right? So the teaching signal should correspond to one or be a high frequency. So they are essentially inputting based on what we want, some sort of, and I already have an arrow there, some sort of a learning signal or teaching signal is what they call it. And what you can actually see is the results here is before, so before we have this, right? Uh, so this is the frequency of the output, of the event rate output for these given pairs. So for zero, zero, it was very low, got a little bit higher for zero, one and one, zero, and then a little bit higher for one, one. So clearly what's happening here before any training has gone down is we're just, the more the more uh, higher frequencies we have in the beginning, the more higher frequencies we have at the end because we're just feeding them forward in no particular way. Um, so it's just coming out the other end and it's no sort of structured format. However, after we've done the learning for zero, zero, we output a low frequency. For one, zero and zero, one, we output a high frequency. And then for one, one, we output a low frequency. And this, this is indeed the XOR signal or an XOR function that it's learning. And this is pretty cool uh, because this was my first time taking a look at simulated biological or simulated spiking neural networks. And it's really interesting to see that they can do this sort of thing. Now, given the XOR function is a very simple function, you know, it's nothing you'll go running to your friends about and, and uh, going, oh my gosh, I got a, uh, I trained an XOR function. You know, it's not the most crazy thing out there, uh, <laughs> but it's, proof that this works to some extent, nonetheless. And it shows that we can essentially have these hierarchical networks and we can do credit assignment in a way that allows learning. So even though it might not be super easy to decide which populations have credit, this, ne this network is, and this learning algorithm is finding a way to do it in a way that is mostly biologically plausible. And that's really the whole point of this paper. And there is some more of this paper. They, they sort of scale this up and they train it on, you know, they try doing ImageNet and they try training on CIFAR or was it CIFAR or something like that, 10. And they get decent results. It's it's pretty impressive, I'd say. And and yeah, that, that's essentially the, the whole point of this paper. I don't want to go too much more in depth now because, or I don't want to go over the rest of it because I think we've already gone quite a bit over this and that was a lot of information. Uh, but if this is the type of thing that interests you, do let me know in the comments. We could go over the rest of the paper and do consider subscribing to the channel. It means a lot to me and it really does help out. Every single one of you that supports me, it really does mean a lot. So thank you so much for watching and I hope to catch you all next time.